Uh, my name's Dean. I'm the pastor at City Church. It's good to be here together. And I believe the most important thing we do, yeah, we can have conversations about political issues. We can do all those kind of things. But the most important thing we can do as a church every single week is open the word of God and hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because our hope is built on the one who's risen from the grave and his name is Jesus. The God's so loved the world that he gave his only son. So whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. We're in a series called The Work. The idea is that God has a work for us to do as Christians. Yes, we're saved by grace through faith, not our efforts, but God has saved us, Ephesians 2 says, to be his workmanship. There is work that God has for us to do, and the work we're going to talk about today is the work of making sure we have an active faith. An active faith will be in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 5 to start. Let's pray together. Our Father, we're so grateful that there really is no one like you. You are the one true God, the creator of the universe, and how amazing that you know us by name. Your word tells us you have a will, a plan for our lives, and ultimately it's to know you through Jesus Christ. We're thankful you give us the Holy Spirit to enable us to understand these things. And I just keep the enemy out of this place this morning. You'd be, through me, you'd be with me as I speak today. You'd be with all the churches in Tallahassee. May a true movement of God happen in this city that is grounded in the truth and makes your will known to our community and beyond. I lift up our missionaries to you all around the world. Please give them a special uh, just understanding of grace today and your nearness to them. And I ask that as we talk about an active faith this morning, we'll leave here today wanting to be people who put feet to what we believe, starting with myself. We're thankful we have the scriptures. Help us understand them. And we ask this all in the name of Jesus. Amen. Here's what the text says. His divine power. So we're dependent upon the divine, dependent on God. His divine power has given us everything. You and I have all we need to live the Christian life. We don't need an extra amount of anything. God has given us sufficiently everything we need by not our efforts, not our intellect. His divine power has given us everything required for life and godliness through, where it comes from somewhere, the knowledge of him. It's driven from our theology who called us, were called to Christ, were called to salvation by his own glory and goodness for the fame of his name and so we can understand his love and kindness for his people. By these, his glory and goodness, he has given us very great and precious promises. So that through them, we bank our lives on the promises of God. That through them, you may share in the divine nature. We partake in this with God. We're his co-laborers. We're one with Christ, we're told. Escaping, it does something. Escaping the corruption that is in the world. Not that we flee from it. We're no longer conformed to it. We're no longer aligned from it. Because of evil desire. A desire for ourselves rather than a desire for God. God's done a work to remove us from that. For this reason... In other words, because of all he's done for us, his, his amazing promises that are special, we're told, and precious and great, because of his glory and his goodness, make every effort. Because of all these things, there is work for us to do as Christians, and we should make every effort to do them. There's some key words in that text, the word given, Think of a gift. It's an important reminder. Again, not our earning. We can remind ourselves of that over and over again because the scriptures do. We've been given salvation. We have everything we need to accomplish the Christian life. He says we're called, as in he brings us to himself. He draws us to himself. He awakens us to himself. That's how big his grace is. And then we're also told it's by his divine power. We depend on the transcendent. Let us never, never lose sight of that. We depend on the power of God in our lives. I love that he calls his promises great and precious. Why are they great? Because they're from God. But why are they precious? Well, also because they're from God, but they're precious because they're for us. They're for us. That our creator, by his sovereignty and by his grace, has extended his arm of love to us in the person of Jesus Christ and has promised us salvation and life with him and that we're new creations and forgiveness of sins. And how does Peter respond to it? It's precious. These promises are great. Why? Because they're for me and they're for you. So I hope when you think of the promises of God, you think, wow, they're great. And also you think they're that special. They're precious. They're personal. They're for me. So since we have been given grace, since we live on the promises of God and from the promises of God, he says, now make every effort, as in get after it. 
have an active faith. And it's important we know as gospel-believing people who are saved by grace and think amazing grace really is real, that we understand that effort is not the opposite of grace. Effort is not the opposite of grace. Earning is the opposite of grace. Not effort, but earning. So after he says, make every effort in verse five, he keeps going. He says, make every effort to do this, to do these things, to supplement your faith, to bring alongside of things into your life with goodness, things you wanna strive for, goodness with knowledge. I wanna grow in my knowledge of God. Knowledge with self-control, that knowledge should lead me to something, it should do something in my heart. Self-control with endurance. My faith is not a flash in the pan. It's not just an emotional high. It's going somewhere. It's a long game. Endurance with godliness. I want to become more like Jesus. Godliness with brotherly affection and how I treat people. And brotherly affection with love. But that needs to be my posture. I need to work towards those things because they're not natural for me and they're probably not natural for you. But God's done a work in us to allow that to be a reality, and now we have to work that out in our lives. For we possess these qualities that he just listed, an increasing measure. They will keep you, and I want to be kept from things that are not of God. They will keep you from being useless. I mean, who wants to be useless? They will keep you from being useless or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. It won't just be a head knowledge. It won't just be an academic pursuit. It won't just be a verse that you read. that will lead us to something greater and something more that is fruitful and used by God for the glory of his name. See, we, we work and make effort to be useful and fruitful for the things of God. That is the work for us to do. That is what an active faith looks like. And how different is that than kind of the contemporary just let go and let God kind of posture? How often do you hear that? Just let go and let God. Now that's true of fear and anxiety and I deal with those things and I think that's good advice. It's easier said than done, but it is good advice to let go of those things and really trust in the Lord. But our faith is so much not a let go and let God faith. It's an active faith that responds and puts efforts towards the things that he is doing in our lives to the glory of his name. See, trusting in God does not put an end to trying. Trusting in God does not put an end to trying. It doesn't end effort. Our faith is not passive. A lot of you wear smart watch, excuse me, smart watches. And what happens after you've been sitting down for a while? You're at your cubicle, you're hanging out, you're at the coffee shop, you're on your laptop, and your watch might say, stand up. Like you need some energy. Kind of let's get going here. Or you need more steps today. You're only halfway towards your goal or you're only a tenth of the way towards your goal. Even when you're driving your car, some of the newer models, if you're driving on the interstate and your car just kind of shifts a little bit to the left or shifts a little to the right, uh, just accidentally, just really quick and then you fix it, the car will say, are you awake? Do you need a coffee break? It'll actually say that. The first time I, I was, my, my car doesn't have that, but I was renting a car and it said that, I was like, how nice of them. It's like, well, you know what? I do need a coffee break. And thank God, Live Oak I-10 just opened a Starbucks. Big upgrade for the panhandle, so I'm pretty excited about that. There's an idea that we should work and be alert and awake and should go and have an active faith. We're talking about the doctrine of sanctification. The doctrine of sanctification. The Westminster Shorter Catechism, get my Presbyterian on, says this, that sanctification is the work of God's free grace. Not earning, think gift, free grace, whereby we are renewed in the whole man, that's our salvation, after the image of God, that happens at your conversion, and are enabled, this is after your conversion, more and more to die unto sin and live unto righteousness. So there's a once and for all salvation that happens that cleanses us and sanctifies us, and then going forward in our faith, we pursue sanctification actively of working those things out and making them realities in our lives. Hebrews 10.10 10 says this, we have been sanctified, past tense, to the offering of the body of Jesus Christ. Jesus, who was perfect, died a death that we deserved, in Christ were declared not guilty, made clean, sanctified. We're presented spotless to him, blameless to him, because he did all that in our place. And it's once we're told, the Hebrew writer says, for all time. 
You don't have to go get sanctified again. It's instantaneously. It happens in your calling and conversion. You were justified by faith, declared not guilty, made clean, made new. Yes, you, yes, me. That's the reality for us. But then after that, we live our lives in light of what God has done for us. We now obey God, in other words, because we can. We're told in the scriptures that the natural person, the person without Christ, can't obey the things of God. They can't understand them. What the scriptures are telling us is now in our active faith, in this work God has for us, we're called to be what we already are. You're called to be what you already are in Christ. Because you're a doctor, you're a physician, guess what then you go and do? Practice medicine. You have patients. You become, become a provider of healthcare. Since you're a teacher, and got your degree in education, and you pass your teacher's test, whatever those are like, guess what you do now? You are a teacher, you're certified by the state of Florida, so guess what now you go and do? You go and teach classes. If you're a volleyball player, guess what you do? You go and play volleyball. You act out what is already true of you. Nip Botzik, a pastor in Savannah, says this, when a believer is savingly united to Christ in time, so when salvation happens and our union with Christ takes place, this aspect of the work of redemption is now realized in the Christian experience. Your salvation is now realized in the Christian experience, meaning salvation now becomes your lived experience. Your salvation in Christ now becomes the reality of your life. Now, your lived experience from Christ going forward is Jesus and the sanctification work that's been done in you. Paul wrote this to the Philippian church. He says, therefore, my dear friends, just as you have always obeyed. He's not saying they're perfect. He's saying just as you have followed Christ since your conversion. So now, not only in my presence, but even more in my absence. I'm going to disciple you, and then I'm going to go to another city to plant another church, he's saying. And here's my hope for you after I'm gone, as someone who's been the one that's been instrumental in your life. Even more in my absence, work out. Work it out. Your own salvation with fear and trembling. He doesn't say earn your salvation. He doesn't say achieve salvation. What he's saying is now live your salvation actively. Let that be your lived experience. And do it with fear and with trembling. Have such a high view of God that you want to make sure you're living your life for his glory and all of God, a reverence towards God. And understanding that his word is true and you must pay attention to it. For it is God who is working. That reminder again. So at the same time he says, hey, you do these works and then the next stroke of the pen. For it is God who is working in you both to will and to work according to his good purpose. But notice in this text, they aren't to work to become part of God's family. He already calls them the beloved in the text. He already calls them friends. He doesn't mean buddies or acquaintances, but spiritual friends. There's family concept there. He wants them to know over and over there's nothing to earn. You might say, you've said that 47 times this sermon. I might need to say it 48. For my own heart, and for yours. But again, grace is not opposed to effort. It's opposed to earning. And this is the case that he's making here. Amy Joseph, she says this, that essentially Paul tells the Philippians to work out, to actualize that which God has already worked into them by grace through faith. We are able to work, she adds, to extort effort. Why? because he has already worked into us power. We have the Holy Spirit. We have everything we need to live out the Christian life. And what Paul is saying here is, okay, this is now true of you. Because of that, work that grace out by how you live in an active faith, the work that God has for you. It's really to kind of, it's common to hear people talk about just how sinful we are and how broken we are. And don't miss how redeemed you are. Don't miss how redeemed you are. If you're a Christian, God has changed your life. Your past does not define you anymore. This side of heaven, yes, you still make mistakes. Yes, you show the need to be saved in the first place. 
that God wasn't kidding when he told you you were a sinner. Yes, you're evidence of that regularly, but don't miss how redeemed you are. Because do that belittles the power of the gospel and the power of God's grace in your life and the power of forgiveness of sins. If you're a Christian in this room and you claim faith in Jesus Christ, crucified and risen, you believe in the good news of the gospel, that Jesus died for sinners, that you've given your life to Jesus, you are so unbelievably redeemed, you have everything in your life possible to live the Christian life for God's glory. All of it. And we need to grow up in that and work that out and put to death sin in our life as we're being renewed in the knowledge of our Creator. So we, it's easy to make the case in the scriptures that we need to be active in our work of faith. But what does that look like for us? Like where and how? The first thing is we need to be active in our relationship with God. We need to work on our relationship with God. Notice he doesn't have to work on his relationship with you. That's really good news. Like when you fall off, he's not the one who's moved. When you don't feel like he's there, he doesn't feel that way about you. Like, we're the ones who move. We're the ones who drift. And we're the ones, thankfully, that have God's wide open door and wide open arms to come pursue that relationship over and over. Part of the work of making you more like Jesus and in the sanctification process is going to be suffering in a broken world and difficult times in the broken world. So what do we do then? Well, our culture's posture is to first, you know, be sensitive, first get defensive, if anybody wants to talk to you about anything going on, well, in reality, we need to lean into God all the more when things aren't going as they, we want them to be. If it's bad choices, all the way to suffering that you didn't create or you didn't predict and you can't help, all the above across the spectrum, we lean into our relationship with God in active work. And what does God give us? God and David Mathis wrote about this. He gives us three things to pursue that relationship and to grow in it actively. He gives us his ear, which is prayer, how amazing we have the ear of our creator that he invites us to talk to him and share our heart with him and to confess things to him. Maybe even sometimes protest things to him. Because we believe he's in that much control. The book of Psalms is that, but it's a lot of that. God invites that. And then he points us. So he doesn't leave us there. He points us to himself. And he points us to his promises when he gives us his voice, which is the scriptures. We have God's ear, which is prayer. We've got to utilize that. And we have God's voice, which is the Bible. Like God has spoken to us through these scriptures. He has told us everything he wants us to know about himself, this side of heaven. Are we taking advantage of that? Like part of our active faith should be pursuing God's ear and hearing God's voice from the scriptures. And then he gives us his body. So we have his ear, his voice, and his body. And what's the body? The local church. Are you leaning into the opportunities here to grow in your relationship with God? A great next step for you ladies out there can be to come to our women's gathering tomorrow night. Maybe just come to our equip classes on a Sunday to kind of a more seminar style things to learn more and to grow in your knowledge of God. To join a city group, be in one of our Bible studies that meets all, all, all over town throughout the week. We can help you do that if you go to the Connect desk, desk afterwards. We can help you find opportunities to lean in to the body of Christ. That's what he gives us. We should actually be growing in our relationship with God. The second thing is in our relationship with others. And that's complicated. Because in our relationship with God, he's the one who's perfect. He's flawless. We're the issue. In our relationship with others, we're both the issue. We always think they're the issue, right? They're the problem. But our relationship with others is we're both sinners. But for Christians, we're all both incredibly redeemed. And if we're going to have strong relationships, we've got to be people who are willing to give the benefit of the doubt, who don't place unrealistic expectations on folks. We need to be folks who do try to put ourselves in the other person's shoes. I know it sounds cliche, but like that really is important in relationships. I wonder why they think that way. I wonder why they acted that way. I wonder why they said that. We need to make sure that we're quick to apologize, quick to forgive. You know, we, we always value the person who's quick to confront and think about, oh, they're so strong. But how about the person who's quick to forgive? The person who's quick to give the benefit of the doubt, to assume the best, which is hard to do. But for brothers and sisters in Christ, we actually should pursue that. We should make choices in our lives that benefit other people. 
And that makes zero sense unless Christ has actually done this for us. So if Christ hadn't done this for us, you just live for you. Like, that's your mission. Just live for you and your little world. Just, just do that. Because Christ died and lived his life for the glory of God, but also for us. That frees us up now to pursue relationships with other people. You read so much stuff nowadays, it's just floating around all the time about how community's so low, people are lonely, people are depressed, people, you just hear so many things. We gotta work on our relationship with other people. We gotta let folks in. We gotta let folks in. We gotta invite people to the table and allow ourselves to enjoy life with each other just as God intended it to be. The third thing is in our relationship to the church, Yes, he's given us his body. It's part of our relationship with God, but specifically to lean into what it looks like to continue to be a part of Christ's church. God has a design for his people, and his design is the local church. So by simply being here today, there's more to it than that, but just your presence alone, you're participating in God's design for his people, which is the local church. So what does it look to be active for this? To be active in the local church, I I would ask you a few things. One is that you have God's ear about your church. And you pray for your church because you're a part of that church. You're a part of this family. Pray for yourself. Now, you're going to represent your church in the community. And you know, with what's happening here right now in our, kind of, in our let's go season, which is our vision to go you know, from our church for the city and to the world and to expand our next generation ministry and reach and all, all the things that are happening here, uh, the devil hates that. I believe the devil is real. Jesus believed the devil was real, a real actual being. The devil's not a metaphor. There really is an enemy There really are spiritual forces against the things of God. And the enemy hates what's happening here. Hates it. Because we're seeing people get baptized, and we're seeing college students on a Tuesday night, and middle and high school students, and we're seeing a ton of kids, and we're seeing all of you, and we're seeing life change happen, and marriages restored, and we're seeing people understand forgiveness, and realizing God's not done with them, and that God gives second chances, and we're caring about issues that matter for human flourishing in our state and across the world. Like, the devil hates those kind of things. And we're not perfect, we're not the only church. We make missteps, because we're human beings this side of heaven. But God's hands on this place right now. And I'm well aware of that. That also leads me to fear and tremble. Because with that comes a tremendous amount of responsibility to make sure that we are being found faithful. And it's never gonna make sense to the world because of the gospel's foolishness, we're told, to those who are perishing. So I would ask you to be someone who has God's ear regularly about your church. And I think one of the greatest things you can pray is that God keeps the enemy away. Keeps the leadership clean and keeps our church white hot for the things of God in our community and beyond. Part of your relationship with the church also is financial. That you're a partaker in this. That you make a a financial plan of how you're going to support your local church. That where your treasure is, Jesus said, your heart is also. So it means if you have a heart for God and a heart for his church, it's going to be evidenced by the fact that you're a generous person towards God's design, that your first and foremost gift goes towards your local church. Your relationship to the church will grow if you're invested in it. Not just financially, prayerfully, attendance, participating. And we count it as privilege because we're putting our lives into God's design. And the fourth thing is our mission to the world. We have a responsibility to get the gospel out. And by the world, I mean our world here in town and then beyond. Here's what Paul wrote. Everything is from God. That reminder again. You're not doing nothing. You can't take credit for a thing, he's saying. Everything is from God. And what's God done? He has reconciled us to himself through Christ. That's the amazing act of love that God has done for us. Our relationship with him was broken. It's not anymore. It's repaired. It's restored. It's fixed. But guess what else he's done? He hasn't just left us there. Remember, it's an active faith. Those of you who have been reconciled, he's given us now the ministry of reconciliation. That is in Christ. God was reconciling the world to himself. What an amazing statement about the gospel right here. Not counting their trespasses against them. But God just can't not count trespasses. Our trespasses are not counted against us because they were counted against Christ who never sinned. And guess what he's done as a result of this? He's committed... The message of reconciliation, be reconciled to God. He's given that message to us. Active faith, working. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. That's our role now. 
We're his representatives since God is making his appeal through us. So he says, how do we respond to that? We plead on Christ's behalf. You can call it proselytizing. You can call it anything you want. God has given us the message of reconciliation. So we plead to Tallahassee, be reconciled to God. That that's the message. In other words, we're working out, which is already true of us. Those who have been reconciled now bring the message of reconciliation. I would love for you to have a spiritual conversation at some point in the next few weeks in your life. And by that, I mean sharing Jesus with somebody. It's going to be a little awkward. It's going to be a little uncomfortable. I understand all those things. But to look for an opportunity to share the hope that you have, to be an agent of reconciliation, pointing somebody to Christ. It might be someone in your own family, maybe a good friend, maybe a coworker. But let's work out that responsibility. Martin Lloyd Jones, the late London pastor, wrote this The New Testament calls upon us to take action. It does not tell us the work of sanctification is going to be done for us. We are in the good fight of faith, and we have to also do the fighting. But thank God we are enabled to do it. For the moment we believe and are justified by faith and are born again of the Spirit of God, we have the ability. So the New Testament method of sanctification is to remind us of that. And having reminded us of it, it says, now then, go and do it. Because grace is not opposed to working, remember, but to earning. And I think ultimately your sanctification and my sanctification will play out in two words. Faith and love. But your convictions are going to grow as in your faith. They're going to be more grounded more established, more unwavering, and your love for God and love for others will grow as a result. That that's going to be the story. Our faith increases, our love increases. Let's work towards those things. Why? Because God has freed us and saved us and redeemed us to be able to do it for the glory of his name. How amazing to be part of the redeemed people of God. Let's work that out and live who we already are. Let's pray together.